So I'm going to talk just for a few minutes now about testing and diagnosis. That's an area that's really improved over the last, say, 15 to 20 years. We've made some really important advances. I think there'll be some more advances made, too. So the, the serology that's used now, uh, so blood test, uh, gives us a very good idea about celiac disease. And there are a number of blood tests that are available in the community. Um, the, uh, the ones that are used the most now are the anti-TTG antibody tissue, transglutaminase, so that's a lot of big words, so TTG, uh, and anti-endomesial antibody. Those are the two that are the most used. And um, they're, they're used the most because they have the best predictive value. If, they're, have a, if, they're, if the test is positive for them, it's a very, very high likelihood that that patient has celiac disease. And if you're negative for those antibodies, it's a very high likelihood you don't have it. Now, there are some problems. There's nothing perfect in life. And so that's true of the uh, serology testing, too. So it is, positive to have, it is possible to have false positive testing for celiac disease with the serology and also false negative. The false positives are seen the most in patients who have diabetes in our uh, experience. But I always tell families that even though the test is positive, um, it's not a sure thing. Um, and we certainly have had children who've had numbers in the positive range who did not have celiac disease. And so the recommendation is always to do an endoscopy and biopsies too, and that's the way to confirm it. Now, there are certain levels of antibody elevation that are so high that we've not yet seen in anyone who's been negative when they get to be that high. And the hope is someday we'll have such a good um, serologic test that we may not have to do endoscopy. But up to this point in time, the, the standard of 2010 is still that you screen first with serology. If that's positive, then you move on to endoscopy with biopsies. Now, it's also important that an IgA antibody get done, too. So I want to be sure you're educated about this. So people send off the screen for celiac disease, but if they don't send off the IgA antibody and the test is normal, and that means that you don't make it, uh, then it may be because you don't make the IgA antibody. So you really have to have two tests. You have to have the IgA antibody to know whether you make that, and then you have to have the um, TTG antibody or the endomesial antibody. Now, antibody levels are not so accurate in children under two years of age, and so sometimes we use uh, the, the clinical picture uh, as much or more than we'll use the antibody levels in a child that young. And again, remember that patients with certain kinds of dis uh, diseases, especially diabetes, uh, are ones where we might see false positives. So uh, what our standard for doing testing now is in 2010 is that we do serology first, and we do two tests, again, the IgA and we do pretty much the TTG antibody is by far the most widely available accurate test. So that's the antibody test that most people would get. They have the IgA level measured and they have the TTG antibody level measured. Um, and then if that is positive, then they are scheduled to have an endoscopy or biopsy and biopsy. And, um, and that really is which, what, what is, allows us to confirm whether a patient has celiac disease or not. Um, certainly, we're looking at the clinical response to gluten-free diet, and uh, we can see that as early as a few days or a couple of weeks after starting the gluten-free diet. Not everybody is blessed with having that quick a response, so some people take longer, but, uh, but people who have celiac disease who are on the gluten-free diet, they, they all respond, but the time of the response varies among individuals. Um, and then we follow people over time with those antibodies. So those antibodies are elevated when people are on the gluten-free diet, when they go on, sorry, mm -hmm. when they're on the gluten-containing diet. When the gluten is taken out of the diet, then those antibody levels should fall to normal. People often wonder what things look like. So uh, uh, when we look under the microscope in the small intestine, which is where the, the primary lesion of celiac disease is, we see finger-like projections, and that's where all of the nutrients get absorbed in the small intestine. People with celiac disease uh, almost always have some blunting of those villi and maybe even have a completely flat intestine. So it's not hard to understand why they have difficulty absorbing things. They don't have that normal absorptive surface. I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes in closing here to talk about follow-up, which ends up being the biggest part because we make the <laughs> diagnosis, but then someone's going to go on and live the rest of their life with this disease. So how do we follow them up? Um, we check the antibody levels. We usually wait a year to test them because it can often take that long for the antibody levels to fall. So again, remember those TTG and endomesial antibodies come off the gluten, so there's no more gluten in your diet. Those antibody levels should, should come to normal. And so for some families, they'll tell us, gosh, you know, my child is doing such a great job and we're being so religious about taking all the gluten out. And we check the antibody levels and they're still really high. So somehow, 
there's, there's gluten getting into the diet. So it's not a magical thing. And usually it's at school or at that sleepover or at that birthday party where that's happening. But it gives us a good way to follow how, um, how carefully people are following the gluten-free diet. And you're not going to be surprised to hear that we have a number of adolescents where what the adolescent is telling us and what the parents are telling us are often two completely different things. And, and it gives us a way that we can work directly with the adolescent and say, so, so this is great that you're not taking any, but we have, a, we have the test that's telling us that there's still some there. So we really have to relook at this and think through how we can do this in a better way. So that's actually been a very helpful um, uh, tool for us in following patients who have uh, celiac disease. So, as it, so the uh, question is when you test a family, how far down the family tree do you go? Do you need to go to Great Aunt Ethel or is it enough to do the immediate family? <laughs> so uh, uh, the, uh, the answer to that is that uh, that 5 to 10 percent chance of someone else in the immediate family having celiac disease if someone in the family has it is where that number, uh, that's where it resides. The question is, can you have a little bit of celiac disease so you could eat, and maybe a mild case, so you could eat some gluten, as opposed to somebody who'd have a severe case of celiac disease and really couldn't eat any gluten? So that's a simple answer. Mm -hmm. Everybody with celiac disease cannot eat gluten. It's an absolute, and it's for life. It's uh, as of now. Now, over people's lifetimes, especially the children who are in this room, there's very likely to be some therapies that may make a difference in that. But for right now, 2010, if you have celiac disease, you can't eat gluten. And so a little bit of celiac disease is a lot of celiac disease in terms of whether you eat gluten or not. You, you can't eat gluten.